Boom! You heard it from him first. In addition to being the only podcast that doesn't care about your feelings, this is the place for unscripted, unfiltered, no bullshit conversation about all things agency ownership, life, and of course, agency sales. This is the best damn agency podcast. I am your host, JJ Russell. Joining me as always, the man, the myth, the legend, LeBron James of digital agency sales, Joey Gilkey. <sighs> they go crazy. And they go wild while he streaks naked. This will be one of a few times that I don't fuck up the intro and say sales in the rocks. I'm just yes. Throw that out there. We are no longer sales in the rocks for this here segment because guess what? This is the only segment. So therefore, mm. it's not a segment. It just it's is. Best. It's the best. It just is. Those of you guys who don't know, back on August 17th, I made the announcement mm. that we are no longer doing the interview portion of the Best Damn Agency podcast, which yes, was our Wednesday yes. edition of the podcast. Why? Two reasons. One, I don't fucking want to do it. <laughs> That's the main reason. <laughs> Two, sometimes you got to put good things to rest in order to advance into mm -hmm. great things. And that is what we're doing. It is great. I think we would rest. do sales in the rocks whether we had anyone listening or not. Yeah, I'd probably do it too. If we had like one, maybe one person. Like if we just had Chris <laughs> Dreyer listening only. <laughs> That's all that matters. <laughs> oh, we just need one. The one faithful. Oh, man. Well, we're starting something new today at SDA that I'm excited about. I'm not sure if it'll be a regular thing, but it will okay. be something we do here and there. It is uh, an SDA happy hour. Yes. So we'll get the team together and uh, rather than solve all the problems and talk of all the official things, we will drink the things and hang out. I think it's important. I think it's something we should culture. do on a regular. Yeah. Especially as the team gets really big. It's just one of those things that cultures, uh, as much as I fucking hate people who just obsess over culture, unfortunately, I now have to obsess over culture because of the, the delicate nature of our specific culture, mm -hmm. because we have a very unique set of core values that um, we have to preserve and protect because the radical left wants to destroy no. them. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, You know what's oh, funny dude. is Jacques Spitzer makes fun of me all the time now because of how political I get. Um. And he seems to throw a sly comments in there every time. So, mm. Jock, if you're listening, <laughs> there we <mind>. uh, <laughs> we're getting a copywriter integrated with a lot of our full engagements. Where yeah, you know they're, they're helping to write copy for, build out sequences for our clients, their sales campaigns, and they've got this long intake form you know, information that the copywriter needs to write the potent copy and. Mm goes all the way through buyer personas and unique selling props and differentiators and like you know the the mindset of your potential buyer all these different things and then down down at the bottom it's like politics <laughs> and i'm like fuck like i don't know what to put there because like oh i'll tell you one, brother <laughs> well one no but it's not it's not for us though no it's for no no clients. it's for them yeah it's for our clients and like i the one client that i'm working with this person four right now is located in San Fran. <laughs> I just wanted, <laughs> I almost in there just put San Fran question mark. <laughs> like that was my answer. They live in their know. own world. Yeah, no, I get it. Oh. That's hilarious. Oh, so I, over the weekend had a realization. Okay. I am old as shit. That's certainly not true. It's relative. No, it is. This is no. This is when I knew that it was true. You say it like it's a binary statement. Like there's old and there's young. It's I I don't believe in non-binary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Right on. Uh so the the only friends that I make now mm -hmm. are the parents of my daughter's kids. Care my daughter's friends. Okay. Question. Are those also yeah. the only people you ever see? Yes, and that's how I know that I'm old as hell. Ah. My when people ask me, you asked me earlier, you're like, hey, this guy you're hanging out with, like, how'd you meet him? I'm like, oh, it's my daughter's cheerleading teammates dad. dad. Yeah. That's dope. I mean, listen, man, you gotta hmm. people have girls, you know, girls are gonna do cheerleading because again, gender roles. And then <laughs> Yeah, we're off <laughs> to a good start here, man. <laughs> we're just making little stabs left and right. 
I'm just kidding, dude. There's some badass boy cheerleaders out there. <laughs> um, anyways, wow, where were we? Oh, yeah, you don't have friends. Oh, you do have friends, yeah. but you'll have friends because you're old. Got I'm it. old. Yeah. I could see that. I mean, if for me, honestly, like for me in our season, I feel I can't, I'm not old or young. I'm a loser. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> My kid's like too young to do sports and stuff to meet people, yep. but he's needy enough to where he needs our time. And so we don't get to do as much. So therefore I don't meet as many people. And so my friends are like from my church and then my friends are like you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, it's a big list. It's well, a long obviously list. like my mastermind buddies. Yeah. We basically just created a mastermind where I could have all my friends do cool shit. It's like your own little fraternity where they pay you to hang out with you. Yeah, pretty much. And we go do fun shit. I mean, and like exponentially grow their business and stuff. Of course. Like, but nope, nonetheless, nope. I'm friends with pretty much everyone in the group. So that's all. Oh, well, it was a sad realization for me. Thankfully, some of these guys are really cool. Like yeah. do MMA. Oh, cool. Like, like to go CrossFit adventure outdoor stuff. I'm like, okay, we can, we can do stuff together that makes me feel less old. So I like also... That. All right, quick quick anecdote about this football game. Did what? I tell you about this football game? I think I think I did. No. So the opposing team rolls up. And we are like suburban, like I don't know, dude. The kids on our team, like they roll out there and they are looking small and like super unathletic. Oh, and then this, like yes. the inner city team rolls up, and I'm like, oh shit. Like mm. They were in their Miami Hurricane replica jerseys that were skin tight. Three of the kids had a visor on. I'm like, dude, we are about to get. There was they no white looked, kids. They looked badass. They looked they looked amazing. Yeah. Um, but I didn't know that our football team is a football factory mm. all the way up through high school, and they're running like it's a feeder program. Oh yeah, the the offense was so complex. And the other team just didn't know what to do. And <laughs> first play went 80 yards for a touchdown. Then they oh, fumbled. Yeah. Then we scored again. Then they fumbled. Then we scored again. Then they fumbled. Then we scored again. And it was 28 to nothing a minute and 12 seconds into the game. Wow. And then all you rich private school kids wow. were like, go back to your poverty. We sent you back to your poor house. All right. All right. I'm totally I, kidding. That, yeah, I know you are. Dude, actually, that reminds me of, um, so when I was 12, I was on an all-star football team. Sure. And so we were, there's like a league, and then like they take the best players from each team. And so we were this all-star football team, and we were just insanely good. And then we went and played in this tournament in Atlanta. And uh, the, the, the championship game was actually held at uh, uh, Clark Atlanta, I think is the school. Yeah. It was yep. like back when the turf wasn't a real thing, but they had turf. And um, we go, to, so we get to the the championship, and we find out who we're playing, and we look at like their um, their schedule of uh, who they beat, and <laughs> they didn't get a game past halftime. It was like eighty nine to nothing at halftime. Every game, other team would just quit. It was like seventy seven to mm. nothing at halftime, and so then we ended up yeah. playing them. So no one scored against them. Um, we ended up playing them and they destroyed us like 47 to seven or something. We're the only team to score against them. I actually scored. Let's, let's, let's go ahead and call it what it is. <laughs> uh, but what's funny, cause they were massive. Like they're all these big jacked black dudes. And we're like, these kids are huge. And we're just a bunch of little white kids. <laughs> and like, let's just be honest. Black people are superior athletes, superior sports. That's not a racist comment. It's just fact. I, for the most part, agree with that. Yeah. Maybe not like tennis Fencing. although there are some dominant black guys in tennis anyways we go get crushed but what happens is we're 12 years old mind you and we thought they were huge they ended up getting um found out that they had i think 10 high school players playing in this tournament with them they're on like the freshman or, or sophomore like jv team and they end up getting in trouble so we end up getting the trophy which is lame because we didn't actually win but it's just one of those things like this inner city. And they were dressed like Miami Hurricanes oh, as well. Dude. Crushed us. It's a good time. Yeah. I've played in some tournaments like that. Um, have you seen Benchwarmers? 
the uh, bench warmers. Which one is that? Is it the baseball? It's the one with the dudes that go back and they suck, but they're like grown men that play with these little league kids. Oh, yeah. And they face some Dominican pitcher who's like 40 years old drinking beer on the mound, but he's got a piece of paper in his pocket that says, I'm 12, and they let Mm -hmm. him play. (laughs) Hell yeah. (laughs) Oh, all right. Here. So, more serious topic. Um, We both, our plates are just like overflowing. Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I feel like you kind of gained some control last week in terms of just like blocking your schedule. I just forced it. Now, my entire afternoons are full, but whatever. Uh, so this is the first time in probably five years that I've had like significant anxiety. Now it's been like, it's Mm. under control. It's like, it's it's not out of control yet. Out of control would be like full on panic attacks, like send me to a mental institution. I don't know. Um, have you had significant anxiety ever in business and Mm. what did you do about it? I don't, um, in business, I don't think so. I'm just real confident in my abilities. Um, so that helps. I've been very, no, that's not true. I've had, um, not anxiety. Like I'm not sure what's going to happen and all that kind of stuff, but just like I'm overwhelmed. It's never business or personal. It's usually a mixture of the both. That's, that's where I'm at. It's yeah. way less about like what outcomes are we going to get? What's the future look like? Because I feel confident in where we're headed. It's more like I don't know how I'm going to do it all. Like Correct. that's the – and it's when it's like if if I felt that way and I wasn't – if I had any spare – if there was extra time to use, like mm-hmm. I probably could – could feel a different way but now it's like dude i just literally don't know how to do it all and it is it is mixed it's like i don't know how to be good at this and not be an absentee father and you know show up for my wife um i don't know it's the first time that i felt that in a long time and and i know it's a season i just try to figure out what to do yeah we'll get a nice break here shortly which is nice nice. but Uh, you remember how when you first started working with me, you were like, Joey gets more done than any human I've ever met. Yep. Um, it's mostly because I did this for five years straight before you met me or four years straight. I just learned how to do a lot of things and I, I became a lot more efficient. So mm-hmm. you're learning your efficiencies, you're learning your capacities and right now you're hitting your, it's kind of like the, um, it's why I always say like sales, put their foot on the gas, try to crush delivery, blah, blah. The goal is not actually yep. to crush delivery. It's just to expand delivery's boundaries so we know, you know, because if you always stay within delivery's boundaries, then you're never going to just grow past them. And if you don't grow past them, then you're not going to grow your business. And so, especially as a service company, you're kind of doing that right now. Like your internal sales team is crushing your internal delivery team, figuratively speaking. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely like a. I, I used to have a buddy that said, uh, "You know, these are all just like capacity stretching seasons." Or I was like, mm-hmm. "It's like exercise. You got to break. You have to break the muscle. You have to break through the threshold to get like to, to the next level or whatever." So, well, well, this season's going to teach you how to delegate, which it already is. You know, like you're going to have to start doing a couple things. One, you're going to start deleting things. I always call it the mm-hmm. odd. I think there's other names people talk about, but mine's always been optimize, optimize. delegate, delete. Okay. So I look at a task. Do I optimize it? Can I make it better? Can I add automation? Can I create a different process? Do I delegate it? Can I get someone else to do this and and accomplish a similar outcome? Or is it just not that important and can I delete it? And sometimes you just do everything. You get in those seasons where you don't even have the luxury of doing the ODD stuff, but it's, and that might be where you've kind of been. I'm just like, I'm just taking everything as it comes and I don't know if I should optimize it, delegate it or delete it. I'm just going to do it. You know? Yeah. I, I feel like I'm I'm learning that I've got a little bit of the entrepreneur's curse or like the founder's curse where my answer to is every yes. problem is not even yes. It's I'm the best person to do this. Yep. Which there's like a lot of pride in it for sure. Like I, I was digging into it last night with Abigail. I'm like, there's no way that I'm the best person to do everything. No. Well, maybe that, maybe that is true. I don't know. Well, it might be, but you're not the best person if you can't give the proper amount of time to everything, which is what mm-hmm. a full-time person. Like right now, 
the sales team is outperforming. Like if you look at lead generation and you look at closing and all that kind of stuff, like the sales team is outgrowing my abilities if I was doing this on my own by a long shot, especially yep. Legion. And it's like, yeah, I, they are not, any one of them is not as good as me if we were going hour for hour. But I don't have hour for hour to compete with them. They all have 40 hours to do the thing. Yep. I'd have five. I'd have eight. I'd have 10. And so when you look at it that way, like they're, they can handle it. Now there's some mm. things where it's not time constrained. It's more outcome focused. And that's a little bit more difficult of like, I need this thing to be at or close to the quality that I would do it. But you get over that too. And like we always say, people can't get as good as you if you're sitting in the seat that they need to sit in. 100%. It's funny. I was, we just brought on a new sales coach. And there's like a lot of these conversations where Abigail's like, well, she's such a good, she gives such good feedback. She's like, this year, like couldn't he? yeah, she's like, couldn't he do that? And I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. Because I haven't let him try it. <laughs> and even if he doesn't get it right for three times, he'll figure yep. it out. He's a smart, sharp cookie. Pay him a lot of money. It's going to be very successful. He just yep. needs the ability or he needs the, the, the space to do it. Oh, good stuff. Real life's life's not always easy. It's not always sunshine and rainbows, but it's all good stuff. It's it's good things to learn. All right. I you did take some time last week to sit down and do one of the things that you are better than almost anybody I know at, which is like work on craft offers, create cat vision. I want to talk about that. But before we do, I'm gonna throw you off a little bit here. I'm gonna throw you off. Are you ready? Mm. Um, we got a trip coming up. Oh, yeah, we do the Dominican Republic. Yep. Uh, at the time of this airing, we're like two weeks away yep. from being on the sandy beaches with 30 badass agency owners talking about growth. Mm. Uh, tell the listeners about the best damn agency mastermind. Oh, you mean this mastermind? If you're watching it on YouTube, you can see the video of it. But if you're listening on audio, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Best Damn Agency Mastermind, per usual. Uh, if we do anything, we do it in an excellent way. We do it to be number one. Number one podcast, number one sales consulting firm, and the number one mastermind. And, and our goal when we entered the mastermind space was to create something that no one could compete with and name it as such, the Best Damn Agency Mastermind, just like the Best Damn Agency Podcast is not just a name. It is a statistical truth, a fact. We are the best name agency mastermind. We're the only mastermind that I believe has this level caliber of agency owners in it. And so JJ mentioned we have 30 guys all flying into the Dominican Republic on the mid to late September to do one of our two annual retreats. We've done Scottsdale. We've done Lake Tahoe. We're doing Dominican Republic. Who knows what's next? Uh, the best name agency mastermind is a group of digital agency owners, CEOs only, who are doing minimum seven figures. We have guys doing between one and a half, two million and 20 million in revenue. So we got guys who are doing some big things, who have done some big things. Uh, and the goal of the mastermind is a couple things. We want to multiply your business, sure. Yes, we want to grow your business, grow your revenue, grow your bottom line. We also want to help you multiply as a leader, a leader in your marketplace, but not just business related. We want to multiply you as a leader in your household leader in your community? How do you become a better father? How do you become a better husband? How do you have more impact with your life and make it more than just dollar signs and balance sheets? And so the Best Damn Agency Mastermind is about that. We bring in the best guests to speak. We bring in the best uh, agency owners who are all part of this group to sharpen one another, cut corners, get cheat codes, ask the hard questions that no one else is asking, answering, etc. We are the best damn agency mastermind. If you are looking for a community of badass seven and eight figure digital agency owners, then I'd, I'd be hard pressed to believe you're going to find anywhere better to spend your money and your time as an investment than the best damn agency mastermind. Come check us out at bestdamnagency.co. Again, that's not .com. Bestdamnagency.co. Watch the video. Tune in. See if it fits your core values, what you're looking for in a group and friends, et cetera. And then click the apply button and we will talk to you shortly after that. And if you go through our gauntlet and we approve you as a member, which isn't easy, then welcome. Your life's going to be transformed. Bestdamnagency.co. Did we fall sorry. off or something? 
Huh? You said you'd be hard pressed. They might not find a better investment and place to spend their money. Oh, sorry. You I lacked some conviction and, there. I just, I, I, I don't know. I was just wanted to see how you were feeling about things. I feel mm. like we still are bona fide. No, the best. We are. If anything, the number two competitor is falling drastically. So, yeah, no, yeah. you're not going to find it. Let's just be honest. Okay. All right. So, mentioned offer creation. Mm -hmm. um, last week, you had time blocked, blank slate, blue sky thinking, you know, but then you had to get, you had to really boil that down to like some actionable stuff. Yep. Uh, so, I want to, pick your brain. I know we, we've talked to crafting offers on here before, but yeah. I want to know like when you have space like that to sit down and create, what's your process start to finish to make the most of that time and walk away yeah. with something that you, you feel good about? Well, I think one new addition to this that our COO Casey kind of introduced is, is what we call smart. We've all heard of like smart goal setting, right? Specific, measurable, attainable, uh, relevant, and timely, right? Which has different meanings, but Casey has brought that to, um, we use EOS entrepreneur operating system. And, and, and part of that is setting rocks, big, massive, move the needle projects every quarter. And, um, two of mine is to create new, two new offers. Um, and, and both of which we attached smart goals and milestones to one is specific. What are the specifics of this offer and why is it important? Um, measurable what are the actual things that i'm going to measure against the work the rock to ensure that it is complete um attainable is that right attainable yeah attainable is is this something that we can actually with our resources and capacity complete this quarter uh relevant is this relevant to our big long-term vision goals etc and then timely what are some of the time stamps as it relates to this project of the milestones that i need to complete um uh, relevant days to keep myself accountable to. So that actually helped improve my process a lot. So I took that, pulled it into a document. Um, and then the different elements that I, I kind of think about, I'm probably butchering the exact names of all these, but I always think about first and foremost, who's selling it? Because I just mm -hmm. care about it. If we can't sell it, then there's no purpose in us doing this. So who's selling it? Um, when are they selling it? What are they getting paid if they do sell it? Um, so that's one big thing. Actually, before that, I just talk about overarching. Like, what is this offer and what is its purpose? Right? So what needles will it move, et cetera? So I talk about the brief offer, what problems it solve, how does it help us, et cetera. Um, and then I talk about who sells it. Um, and then after that, I ask who's involved. So what all players on the team, whether it be one time or it be every day or it be a few times throughout a long period of time, who all is going to be involved and what is their involvement going to be? Just one sentence per person. And then once I figured that out, I want to ask, what is the deliverable? So what is the mm -hmm. client going to be receiving? What are the different spokes of the wheel? What's the different mechanisms um, that we're going to do? And then I ask, how? How are we going to do it? So some of that part of the how is is more on your, your team, the delivery team and KCR COO to figure out some of the mechanics there, but it's like, what tools are we going to use? What people are going to be involved? How long is the thing? Um, you know, how often are we going to meet with people? You know, what's our templates we'll use process, et cetera. Once I get through that, then I think through the logistics of like, okay, what are our costs of goods sold to actually pull this off? Cause at the end of the day, if it's not a one, if I can't sell it two, if we can't deliver it and three, if it's not profitable, it's not an offer I care to do. Um, if I can't crack those, those codes, um, and then the last thing is approval. So who who all needs to sign off on this in order for us to to fully ship this thing? Oh, and then actually, sorry, before that, it's uh, what needs to get done for us to um, roll this out. So an example would be, I need to train the sales team on this new offer. I need to create a one pager on this offer, yep. I need to, et cetera. Um, so, so that's, that's kind of how I think sweet. about it. Different elements. Yeah, I love to, you know, for our leadership team, you put all that in a document and then you've recorded a 15 minute video of mm -hmm. yourself talking through all of those elements because there's a lot more color commentary that you were able to add yeah. verbalizing it than just like written down, which was really good. So yeah, um, it's, it's definitely in my zone. I've kind of learned to have a few things in my zone. Uh, my buddy who's actually going to come to talk to the mastermind um, tomorrow. We've been talking back and forth and like uh, something I've kind of realized is just like natural to me that a lot of people 
I don't, I don't, I didn't think of it as a superpower until I realized he just kept asking me. And he's like, holy shit, you literally know everybody. One of my superpowers outside of like offer creation and sales and influence is, is network. Like my ability to connect, so my connectedness. Um, I've been learning a little bit about that recently too. It's been kind of cool. That's awesome. Yeah. You feel like that pulls into, I guess that's not a huge part of this offer creation process. It's just. No, I just thought it was interesting. Like I was going back to saying like one of my superpowers is being able to sit down and craft offers that are compelling mm-hmm. and that we can sell and that, you know, not always a winner as we've noticed with the hire and train offer, but um, that wasn't an, an, an offer uh, failure from a sellability perspective. It actually was pretty easy to sell. It was uh, um, what I learned in that process of that last offer that I flopped. It didn't flop financially. It flopped from a deliverability perspective. And so what I've learned is that how part portion of, mm-hmm. of the offer does not need to be on my plate. It needs to be on the delivery team's plate Yep, to own that yep. because I'm not as involved. I'm not involved at all really in delivery. For sure. That's good, man. <coughs> I love that you leaned into your, your, I don't know. It felt like it was kind of life giving for you last week to lean into what you're great at, which is awesome. Yeah. And that was fun for it. Um, sweet. All right, here, here's a fun topic. So turning the corner into like more kind of just down and dirty sales topics. Ooh, down and yes. dirty daddy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We don't care about your feelings or your wife's feelings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I threw that in the intro. That's I know I liked aggressive. it. I really liked it. It was great. Um, right now we are in a, a job market where base comp mm-hmm. continues to like run up and so yeah so for salespeople, right like over the last 12 months everybody I mean, we, dude we've yeah but i'm saying specifically for sales yes base comp has just been on this like runaway train where 18 months ago we were looking at 55k base and now we're looking at a 75k base for the same person yes or it, 130 it, yeah I mean, <laughs> like depends. Just hired. It depends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's not that's not the same person. That guy's freaking world dominator. Um, yeah. So it it is partially a result of like there there's some inflationary numbers in there. Mm-hmm. There's some there's some like macroeconomic factors at play, but a lot of it's like demand gen for these for these people and, and the fact that employees have a lot of leverage right now. Totally. How do you treat that? The unique situation that I'm thinking through right now is um, not many other positions are quite as performance driven. None of them are as performance driven as sales. Correct. And yes. So the more the base pay floor rises, the more comfortable salespeople become. Mm-hmm. So how do you fight against fire them? You fight against that. You fire them. That's it. You just keep it's a little. I mean, honestly, it's it's. If you have accountability, transparency in your sales o- operation, your sales org, then you have all the evidence you need to fire someone who's getting comfortable. That's it. I mean, that's I think it's the only way you combat it. And like they can go, they can go find their comfortable place elsewhere. It's not gonna be my fucking place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um and I cut your last end of that question off, but that's that's where I knew you were taking it was basically like, how do you how do you combat this? It's like, well, I don't know that you combat it from like a dollars in. It's just they have a shorter leash, in my opinion. Um in a lot of ways. And so I think that's but then at the same time, you gotta be communicating, you gotta raise your prices, right? To kind of match inflation or whatever. Like it, all this is inflation, like all these different elements. Um uh, contribute to inflation. And so same thing is our buyers are going to experience inflation by us increasing our prices as well. So that's one yep. way you can combat it. But the comfortability question really comes back to a couple of things. One, they can be comfortable. I want them to be comfortable, but I want them to be comfortable in the profitability range that I'm comfortable with. Um, and so they get there and they want to coast and, and it's a sufficient place that I want them to be, which for me is minimum seven X, if not 10 X on target earnings. Meaning if they make 300 grand, they better drive me 3 million. That's kind of my, mm-hmm. my goal. If they get there, like coast away, big boy, I don't care. Like that's a healthy place for our business to be. If you want to coast and chill, that's great. Um, 
I would argue that you're not the type of ambitious person that I would ever want to bring into like an equity conversation because yeah, I am no, uh, I'm not afraid of bringing high value employees into an ownership type of position. Um, as seen with you, as seen with other people coming down the pipe, but um, I would not, if someone who's not that ambitious and who wants to just coast and be comfortable and chill, it's probably not someone that's ever going to get that type of opportunity, but you can have a home as a salesperson being comfortable, making good money with me. Have you seen in this market, it still work to like really skimp down on base pay, but pay out like massive commissions. Like are there people that are still willing to take that set up? Um, the commission plan has got to be pretty, pretty strong. Um, and you need to be going into an environment that's just heavily, heavily proven and trained and, and all that kind of stuff. Like I, I still think that happens. Um, a good example would be um, Memory Blue, who's like a outsourced SDR company. They don't pay a very high base salary for their SDRs. It's not chump change, but it's like 38 to 42 k or something. Sure. Our SDRs are making between 55 and 65 you know, base pay plus commission. And so um, I'm also not super desirous to hire someone who doesn't have any experience um, or doesn't have that, that uh, transferable experience in a different industry. Um, so that's, that's my thinking. Um, but I would say we pay SDRs pretty well compared to the market. Um, and so I, I just don't subscribe to that pay people cheap. Um, I did when I was running Tribe before, but I just learned the extra $1,000 a month for a, a better employee, the extra $2,000 a month to retain someone is, is it pales in comparison to, I mean, especially when you have $90,000 deal sizes, it's just, you'd be silly to not, whatever, you get it. No, I get it. And, and some of it comes back to like making sure you're hiring somebody with the right makeup, mm -hmm. right? From a mentality. It, it's really drilling down on like, do they have that internal motivator yeah. grinder? Like, I guess no matter what the situation is, you could hire somebody that's just going to kind of sit on their ass. I mean, outside of like them doing full commission sales, and not making any money, which yep. barely exists. Uh, you're not going to get anybody that's, that's quality doing that. Um, everybody's going to have some level of comfortability they can fall back on, even if it is only 40 or $50,000. Mm -hmm. The person with the mentality to sit on their ass is going to sit on their ass. And the person with the mentality to yeah. really lean in and go get it is going to lean in and go get it. And they're so. just not going to, I mean, like we just, we fired an SDR within 60 days of him starting. He was doing okay, but he didn't have that drive mentality. He made excuses. He did not fit our number one core value, which is own your shit. Right. And so liked him as a person, wished him well. I'm now a reference for him in his new job, but he didn't, he's not gonna make it here. And, and I knew that cause we have transparency and yep. unfortunately, you know, we got to kick him to the curb because he's not a, as EOS calls it, a GWC. Get it, want it, capacity. Get it, want it, capacity for it. Casey, if you're listening, I love you, but your EOS jargon sometimes makes me want to go vomit. It's better than the jargon we had before, which was not. I know, we had no <laughs> jargon, and we needed it. We needed it. We did. Um, we still do. We, yeah, we, know we still do. So, sales sequences, building campaigns. Yeah. Omni-channel campaigns, right? So we're going to probably leverage social, phone, mm. email, voicemail, you know, some, some, something in that range, some combination of those things. Um, how, many, how many contacts do you drop into a sequence to validate its validity? Validate the sequence's <laughs> validity? validity? Yeah. Uh, yeah, like, is it working? <laughs> There's do this so hard because there's so many variables. It's how good is the salesperson? Is it the salesperson's tone? Is it the salesperson's message? Is it their copy? Is it your email deliverability and domain health? Like all those different things go into like successful sequencing. And, and so it's hard to give like a standardized answer. Um, but usually like, and, and they're all different, right? Like phone calls have different metrics for success than email, which is different than social. Social is a long play. I don't put any stats around social ever. I don't, I don't give a shit. I don't ever depend on it. I don't care if it's a main lead driver or not. 
Um, I know some people love it. Like some of the SDRs are like toying with some new LinkedIn tools. Don't give a flying fuck. Don't care. Love you guys. Matthew, Mike, Brandon, use all the tools you want if it makes you successful, but we're never going to be a, a, a social first. We're going to be phone first, um, which is a commitment I've made over the, probably the past year. Um, whereas I was, I was more agnostic on f- what I'm going first, maybe leaning heavier towards email, but I've just learned like the phone is fucking badass if you can crack the code. Anyways, I digress. So I look at like mm-hmm. phone calls. Like I have one coaching client. I don't like to coach people at all. Um, but I have one guy who just as much as I've tried to make him quit, he won't. Um, <laughs> That's how you, you know, know he's a good client. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe. Um, but the I, I've told him because he's a smaller agency. He's like, dude, you got to make the phone calls. If no one else is going to make them, you got to make them. And he came back to me and he had made like 200. And I was like, sick. How long? It's like over the past eight weeks. I was like, not sick. That's awful. Like realistically, I want to see 500 dials before I know if a script is working. Hmm. Because there's just so many variables going inside of 500 dials, you know, that they're learning their messaging, all that kind of stuff. There's tonation. Like I want to tweak all those things before I just throw it out. As it relates to email, you can get a pretty decent sample size in 50 emails, 100 emails. You can know if a subject line's opening. You can know if you're getting a good response rate. You can know if you're getting a good conversion rate. Um, and so usually 500 cold calls, 300 phone calls, maybe at the lowest, and then probably a hundred to 200 emails usually is, is what I'm looking at from a volume perspective to see if it's worth punting or not. At what point? So let's say that you run people through a sequence, Mm -hmm. right? Um, let's say that 10% of them convert out of the hundred into Mm -hmm. some kind of call, solid, solid campaign. Yeah. Um, what do you, the the next ninety? I mean, are you just dropping them? Is the is the last to do in the sequence? Let's you know put them into campaign two, and it's it's something that could run in parallel to campaign one. I mean, is that the next to do with people that shake yeah, out? Yeah, so like campaign one, call it ten to fifteen touch points total. If someone's falling at the bottom of that and not converting, then I'm typically throwing them back into um, stack two, which if for those of you who have not been in my ecosystem or a client, you don't know what stacking is, but I'm sending them back down to a category, um, stack one or stack two. I'm sending them down to a category that basically says um, they're not engaged, they're not active, etc. But I'm putting a task on them for sending them back in at another point. Um, so I'll probably move on to a different batch of contacts after 15 touch points, but then I will do a circle back and just recycle that same 90, call it two to three months later, and I will hit them with a different angle, different campaign, et cetera. At what point, if ever, do you pass them off to marketing for like drip, more drip focus? Instantly. Kind of- yeah, when they fall at the bottom, instantly add them to a marketing campaign. And that's okay, just so, nurture value based. So you go campaign one, mm-hmm. then they're in, in the drip. Mm-hmm. And then and then back into campaign two, and they're yeah. So it goes. Or they staying in the drip the whole time. Sales campaign one, 15, yep. 12, 10, 12, 15 touch points. That's cold calls, email messages, and LinkedIn messages. Um. So campaign one, if they fall at the bottom of that and don't produce, I drop them down in our like active prospecting list, and I put a task to start another sales campaign two to three months down the road. In the meantime, I will have the sales team mark them as a marketing contact, which adds them to a marketing list that all they're going to get is a weekly drip nurture. Joey's providing value. They might convert that way. If they if they don't convert, then they go back into sales campaign two in 60 days, 90 days, which is more of that aggressive cold call, cold email, LinkedIn. Can I poke that approach? To 100%. I don't give a shit. I want to poke it. Poke away, big boy. <laughs> um, okay, so you had it. They're, they're kind of like they're sales, not sales. Qual- they're, they're people that you really want to go after, which is why they're mm-hmm. in you know these sales sequences. They are higher priority outbound targets. Um, yes. The minute you add them to a, you know, as a marketing lead to a marketing campaign, don't you run the risk of them opting out? In which case, you cannot send any additional sales emails to them from yes. HubSpot. Okay, but 
were they ever going to convert on a sales campaign? Maybe I don't know. Maybe if they opt There's out still- of a value-driven campaign, I, I very well might be missing out on some people. But then there's also some people who you've warmed up enough to where when you do a sales campaign, they convert. Or you don't have to get yeah. to the second sales campaign, and they do convert because they see you providing value. They go to the website, they fill out a form, they download a lead gen thing, all those types of things. So it, that might be happening. But I'm looking at the risk reward of that situation. I'm probably still electing to drop them into a nurture. Yeah, that's really that makes a lot of sense, man. I I do think that what you give up in terms of potential opt outs and building authority and trust and the ability to oh yeah to win. Yeah, I think it's it's totally worth it. And the good thing um, too is like, and this is all if it's outbound, right? And then a little bit of marketing, but if you at some point you will get pretty like for us, like we are getting to the point now, we're getting very close to where we're going to have that tipping point where we're gonna start turning on our marketing engine retargeting ads, et cetera. And all I'm going to do is add those people that opted out into a Facebook campaign or a LinkedIn retargeting campaign that's ad-based to paid media. And they might re-engage that way. I don't know. but No, that's good, man. It's a very Um, long One place that we workshop this with clients is for those who jump in to be a part of what we're doing at The Sales Driven Agency. The Sales Driven Agency. Agency. That is our main company. That is the largest reason why we're no longer even doing the interviews on this podcast is because we need to allocate time and resources back into that business because it is growing uh, tremendously. I feel like we're hiring 50 people at a time sometimes. (laughs) Not actually, but it feels that way. Um, Sales Driven Agency, we are a consulting firm slash agency for agencies, except for what we agency is we build out sales operations. So unlike you guys who are doing paid media campaigns, creating content, doing SEO, etc., we are building out sales operations. And who are we doing it for? You, digital agencies. And so what we do is we come in and we build out sales processes. How do we get repeatable outcomes in your agency as it relates to selling? How do we do outbound sales? How do we craft campaigns like we're talking about? How do we build lists? How do we work technology to make us more efficient and effective? The second piece of that is salespeople. We actually have an internal recruiting team that all they do is hunt for, recruit, and onboard your salespeople for you. So you don't know who to hire, we do. We go out and find them. You don't know how to do the compensation plan, we craft it for you based on how you answer certain questions. Once they start, you don't know how to onboard them, we create the onboarding. Once they've been onboarded, you don't know how to train them, we train them with our sales trainers and our sales training curriculum. So all that's handled for you. And the last element of the three pillars, we've got sales process, salespeople, the last is sales enablement. So what technology are we building out? What knowledge base do we have? Uh, What lists are being built for you? What campaigns, templates, scripts, et cetera, are being built for you to enable your salespeople to run the sales processes? All of that put together with a bow tied around it is a sales operation of which we have built hundreds of for digital agencies like yourself. So if you're looking for a sales operation that helps you create predictable growth that you want a stable sales operation built for you, go to www.salesdrivenagency.com. Check us out, read up about us, book a call. Again, that is www.salesdrivenagency.com. Sweet. All right. I want to pick your brain on... Best way to leverage lead magnets, downloadable mm. you know, pieces of content where we're basically just trying to capture contact info. Yeah. Um, not People aren't necessarily converting or filling out a form. Yeah. Um, they're more just trying to get through the gate to get the thing. Cool. Um, so I've got a couple clients right now that have 10 different forms like this circulating, whether it's marketing emails, different social things they were running like tools in their toolkit. Yeah. So they've got all these forms collecting prospect contact data. Yes. The question is what's the best way to leverage it, right? So these are these are people that we know are they're warm, they've got some kind of interest like depending on the type of article or or tool like some are more intent based than than others. Mm-hmm. Um do, is that something that needs to go to directly to your marketing team or would you leverage those leads and like send them straight to a lead inbox that's being um quarterbacked by your your sales team yeah i think that um 
I'm not the best to answer this simply because I'm not a marketing guy necessarily. Sure. I'm more of a sales sure. guy in a marketing world. Um, however, I see it a bunch. I know how it's run. I know it's run really well. Um, realistically, you need to have... This is why I always say sales first, then marketing. Right? I, I'm always going to be a guy who says build a sales team before you build a marketing engine because the you can maximize your marketing uh, resources tenfold if you have a team of people who are working the people who come through your marketing if all you're doing is 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 relying on a nurturing email sequence on the back end of them getting your ebook or getting this white paper or getting this checklist then you're going to fall like you have to compel people sometimes into booking a call yes you might build like brand affinity by just nurturing and providing value but ultimately you make money not off of affinity you make money off of sales and sales Mm -hmm. requires meetings and meetings require asks and so you know my favorite model would be for you to drive have a strong lead gen engine that's just sending all leads into the system and those leads maybe go through a, a a nurture sequence but before maybe even doing that you actually drop those leads to your sales team. And those are like your low hanging fruit, what we would call stack three in our stacking methodology. Again, you don't know what that means if you're not a client, but you would, (laughs) sorry, there's different levels to stacks, right? You have people who've never been contacted, people who've been contacted that aren't engaged, people who are engaged, but they're not booked on your calendar yet. People who've been booked on your calendar and people who are active deals. Those are like the levels of stacks. The stack three that I just mentioned is those priority leads that that are engaged, meaning they just downloaded something, they're interested in what you're doing, but they're not booked yet. And so those are like low-hanging fruit for your sales team to like pick up the phone, drop an email, hit them up on LinkedIn. Like they are active and they're activated prospects that you can quickly turn into leads, marketing uh, or sales qualified leads, simply by being a little bit more aggressive on the sales side. So that would be my approach. Yeah, I That's see actually where you could we're going to do here okay. shortly because we've not taken our marketing super serious outside of like being consistent with the podcast. Um, I'm going to probably turn a lot of our paid things. I'm going to probably slice them up into not paid things, but just smaller chunks. Um, and then basically when someone downloads something, they're going to get a phone call within 10 minutes from my sales team. Yeah, I love that. Um, Especially now that we're going to have our new offer for the smaller agencies who are mostly going to be the ones who are probably downloading this stuff. We <laughs> it's gonna be badass. I'm excited. That offer <laughs> Um, we'll talk about it. We'll we'll talk about it as the launch date gets a little closer. Yeah, TBD on when like, that's gonna be. It's sometime yeah, in we'll, September. We'll get, we'll get there. Um, yeah, I, I love the idea of having a sequence then that a sales rep could drop these people into. That yeah. would be like, hey, you drop them in. The next step, like immediate step, is a cold call, voicemail drop, email. Uh, yep. that, that's pointed to in the voicemail and then they and then from there maybe it's just like you know email drip that starts to space out over you know a month or whatever yeah. um also do can i tell cool. can i tell the audience about what we're doing with uh validating leads uh let's leave it here as a teaser okay and let's ink the deal first and then we'll we'll tell them well the deal is already getting inked Unless you inked it today. <laughs> well, I'm trying to buy the business as we speak. <laughs> but uh, anyways, no. Well, I'll, I'll it's a good it. teaser. It's a good teaser. Here's the teaser. Imagine a world where you had a list of 500 prospects that were cold lists that your salespeople were going to either be cold calling, emailing, or doing something on social with. Imagine if you got that list sent back to you segmented on who's likely to answer the phone more, who's likely to answer the email more and who's likely to engage on social more. And you could craft your campaigns around, Oh, if these are phone people, then I can send them into a phone heavy campaign sequence. If these are email people, then I can drop them into a heavy email with a little bit of cold calling and social built in. Or if these are social people, then I won't even bother with the phones and I'll just do email and social. Imagine a world where you do that. Your conversions will skyrocket. We're it's doing pretty badass. Yeah, we're doing it's it internally, but we're also doing it for our clients. It's exciting. It is. We'll, uh, we'll give you the details in a future episode of the Non Sales in the Rocks Best Damn Agency podcast episode. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, let's wrap with this because we got a happy hour to get to here with our team. Yeah, we do. Um, we got a lot of companies 
that we work with that do they do kind of full service digital um mm -hmm. but they do like perform they do performance marketing and then they also have like a branding element or a, a video element or something that's a little bit more a web development element something that's more project based okay. um what what is the most effective initial point of sale if you're doing cold outreach? I mean, it could be segmented by industry. It could it could really depend on who you're selling into. But have you seen outside of like a specific foot in the door offer? Mm -hmm. Is it better going in cold to lead with digital or to lead with video production, web development, project based work? You're not gonna like my answer, but it's it's it depends. Right. It, it depends okay. on, you know, if you're mid to enterprise market, then you're probably going to kind of have to just come in with the main offer and because they know what they're looking for. Unfortunately, okay. that's your, your approach. If it's SMB market, smaller, mid sized companies, then, then you have a little bit more flexibility there. Um, and even then, it, it's industry by industry, product line by product line. Um, but I would say as a whole, you are, you are more likely to get in the door with a project that has a specific outcome and then upselling into a ongoing engagement that has maybe not a specific outcome like that we're just aiming for, but more or less a direction that we're heading in. Um, then you are just selling straight into a long commitment retainer. Yeah. Unless you can no, attach to a retainer a value prop slash guarantee slash something um, that mitigates some risk for the buyer. Okay. Like a 90 day out or a... Yeah, 90 day out or some money back thing or some... Which I don't like money back things to be quite honest. They create really shitty clients. Um, but some some variation where it it makes the investment and therefore the hit and the risk a little bit more palatable. Yeah. Yeah. Segmentation. I mean, it is, it, it makes sense. It's going to be nuanced by situation. It is. Um, but for most of you guys listening, you're probably in that second half, which is potentially sell a project uh, to get a specific, out just sell something that gets us a very specific outcome, price it accordingly, and just know how to upsell in that product. Like right now, we sell a project that gets a very large specific outcome. It's harder to sell. We do have the foot in the door on the front end, but now that we're introducing different offers, we're even having to strategize like when do we introduce the upsell conversation and what would be the yep. most strategic time and who needs to do it and what are they getting paid if they do it and that kind of stuff. I love it. As always, uh, it might not be the only answer, but it's a good answer. Sure. Shooting from the hip here in this unscripted, we don't care about your feelings podcast. <laughs> really latching on to that. <laughs> I think you're latching on because like, you care about people's feelings. Oh, I do. I do. Just a little. I care way less than I've ever cared. Um, you kind of have to. I care a lot less about what they think about me. I still care about their feelings. Mm. I don't know. How do you feel about potentially going to the Army Navy game this year? Oh, shoot. When is that? So December 10th. I feel like that'd be freaking amazing. Yeah, I might have an in. Do you? Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Who's your in? Marty's got a fish friend. <laughs> is it so, Bill? What? Is it Bill? Is his friend Bill that I just got hooked up with that does the copywriting? A different no, friend? No, I don't think so. I figured Marty only had one friend. So I thought my Marty has plenty of friends. He has, he has a really I'm weird. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Love you, Marty. <laughs> no, Marty's already blocked off hotels potentially and he's getting. A oh, that's tickets. sick. So if you want to go, sick. we might be able to make it happen. Oh, dude, I would love to. Let's talk about it. All right. Yeah. Enough about that. Um, as you heard, it might not be labeled sales on the rocks, but you're going to get the same unfiltered, unscripted conversation every week here. Yep. Uh, the only reason I didn't have bourbon this week is because I'm about to drink a glass of bourbon with our team and I didn't <laughs> want to be drunk to put my kids <laughs> to sleep. So <laughs> yeah, That's the only reason I wasn't drinking too. And uh, I've been, so I've been dieting, dude. I've been freaking... I've been on it. I, patrol again. I've been dieting because some days I blink and realize that I forgot to eat like two meals. <laughs> that used to happen to me all the time. I'll get there. I'll get there. We're climbing out of the hole. It's been good. It's all growth. It's all exciting. Welcome. All right. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. As always, rate, review, subscribe. You are uh, our beloved listeners. We could not do this 
without you. And we are grateful for your time and attention. Uh, we will see you back here. Is it, It's going to be Friday, right, Joey? Every week, Friday? For now, we're going to keep it on Fridays if we ever optimize it for a different day. Great. But this is our, I mean, yeah. this is our we'll best segment anyway. We'll see you on a day. We'll see you a day. We'll sometime. see you one day. For sure. <laughs> Guaranteed right. one day a week. Guarantee that. Until then. Fuck your feelings. Oh,